That's right. Welcome in, everybody, to a Michigan Man Misery Edition of the Always Irish Show. Now, listen. Before we get into this, thank you. I see the systems picking up. People are starting to cross over from StreamYard into YouTube as we let everything situate here. I got to start this show by saying this. Here's the first thing. If this goes bad on us and somehow we get trolled here and I'm doing this, then that's the best troll of all time. I'm not even going to be mad if this is some big setup, but it, I don't think it is. And so... I think what we're in for is a lot of Michigan people that are mad and they're going to say they didn't want this guy and that he's not that good and, and all of that. And I'm here for all of it. I'm here for all of it. Life as a Notre Dame fan is tough a lot of times. And if you're in my age range, it's been tough almost all the time. I'm taking what I could get. And this one's going to be delicious. This one is going to be delicious. So welcome in, everybody. I'm going to open the phone lines, 312-988-15. I see somebody on hold already. I'm going to get to first. So go ahead and call if you want. Here's the deal. We're going to talk about some of this before the announcement happens. And then once we know it's a for sure thing, then we, we could move into some other stuff. Um, but I think this is interesting, and there, there's some things to talk about here. So there's a famous quote that goes around Notre Dame land, and it's called, the best players in Michigan go to Notre Dame. That's either going to happen tonight, or we've all been trolled and rickrolled, but I think it's going to happen tonight, okay? And here's here's the thing. It, it, it's... If this goes the way people think it's going to go tonight, everybody seems to think it's going to go tonight, it would be Notre Dame's highest quarterback recruit commit since, who knows what it is in the chat, somebody guess. The last time we had a quarterback commit ranked this high was when and who the hell was it? It was a long time ago. Somebody put it in the comments, take a guess. If you guessed, 2007 Jimmy Clausen, you would have been correct. Coming out of that limo with the furs and all that stuff, looking like a baby ostrich, fresh out the egg, all of that, right? Yeah, there you go. There's there's a bunch of Clausen people. And you know what? Jimmy Clausen's a tough one. I kind of, I didn't like the whole ostrich look and all the showboating, but he also didn't really have a chance to succeed because of we had no offensive line and everything was bad. But that's a big deal, all right? That's a big deal. Now, it's one thing getting a five-star quarterback. Anytime you could do that, you're going to do that. You're going to love it. You're going to be thrilled. But the idea that Notre Dame's been heavily in the mix for two five-star quarterbacks who both come out of the state of Michigan warms my heart. It warms my heart. His daddy played at Michigan. Gramps was the head coach at Michigan, the famous Lloyd Carr name. It's a double win for me. This is a double commit win for me. If this goes the way that we think it's going to go, I'm sorry. It's immature. I'm almost 38 years old. But the fact that this is going to bother Michigan people is one of the best parts of this. It just is. And I'm not, I, I, at least I'm mature enough to admit that. Okay. I'm mature enough to admit that. Now, Here's the thing. This rumor has the Michigan fan base shook. This rumor that he's got that last name, Carr, and he's going to be driving it into the stadium Rockney belt. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's got the Michigan fan base. They're all messed up. They're all shook up. Mean tweets about the kid. Michigan media members arguing with the kid's mom online. That's been going on multiple days. Michigan media members deleting takes saying they're still in the race for this guy's services and it's not over. My direct messages are filled with all sorts of nasty language. I'm a, I'm a good Catholic boy. I can't handle reading all the stuff they want to do to me and they want me to do to myself that I might later after this. I might be so excited. I might have to take them up on their advice if you're following me. Okay. If you're following me. So Let's just say, just the thought 
of this guy with this name picking Notre Dame has put this fan base and the media in a tailspin. EJ Holland, the recruiting writer, he's probably typing up an article right now. This kid's really not a five-star. We weren't that interested. No big deal. Not a good fit. You know, EJ type stuff. I just hope he does it on the right account this time and, and remembers to log out of the burner and do it from his real account. Okay, do it from the real account, EJ, if you're going to do it. Make sure you log out of that burner, okay? Make sure you log out this time. But that's the way it goes. That's just the way it goes. Can't handle it. Can't handle it, okay? So here's the thing. It, when you say to a Michigan person, you know, we're, we're deep in this mix for Dante Moore and we could debate whether that's cooled off or completely dead or still in the mix. I know people are still debating that. We could talk about all that. But when you talk about all this stuff with them about the current dynamic of recruiting, current right now, the recruiting that's going on that is going to impact the future results on the field. When you're on Twitter and you bring this up to these Michigan people, the first thing they say is, remember 2019, three years ago when we killed you at the big house? That has nothing to do with this discussion. When you have a bleak future, you look at the past and that's all they have. I tell these people every day, what does the game score of three years ago have to do with us out recruiting you now that's going to make us win down the road? Those things are not connected, but they can't see it. They don't want to see it. They refuse to see it. They don't get it because they don't want to get it. Okay? They would rather talk to me about a game three years ago than have to have a tough conversation of why did we just have our best season in 20 years and the best players don't even want to go here when they're from here? Wouldn't that be a more productive discussion for them to have instead of all the deflection, all the spin, all of it? We didn't like this guy. We didn't push for him that hard. Those articles are out today. I wrote these notes this morning saying, I guarantee they're going to come up with this stuff. Spin it, say they weren't that interested, all that stuff. They actually did. I figured they would, but I thought maybe they'd back off. They didn't. They all did it. Those articles are out. We didn't really want this guy that hard. They would rather insult me on the internet than ask their own program coming off their best year in 20 years why they can't recruit elitely the truth hurts and they don't want it not interested not interested at all it's just so funny when the dante moore to notre dame stuff heated up when that was a thing month ago the gold throne all that when that heated up the stories were out you know what, maybe Michigan doesn't need Dante, you know, whatever. It's not that big of a priority. Those were the stories. But it's weird to me. Now that it looks like we're going to get CJ Carr, magically the stories flipped, and now I'm hearing and reading, you know what, I think we do want more. We need, we need more. That, that, that's, I think, where we're going to go here. That, that's, you know, now, now they're all back on the more thing. So, Rather than address the truth and ask their own program tough questions, it's all spin from them. It's all narrative from them. Deleting their own takes and tweets and redoing them and making it up. It makes me happy. It just makes me happy. Now, here's the thing. A part of this was supposed to be, okay, Notre Dame's in it for CJ Carr. If Notre Dame gets Carr, shouldn't that theoretically put Michigan in a better position to land Dante Moore, right? That's the big discussion going on right now, okay? Here's the issue with that. Yes, I guess by process of elimination of getting great quarterbacks, that does make sense that like Notre Dame spots filled, even if he doesn't reclassify into 23 and it's 24. The Michigan thinking now is, all right, this domino is going to fall. Then that opens up, knocks Notre Dame out of the competition for Dante Moore. We can move in and scoop up our own guy, Dante Moore. Here's the thing now. Here's the thing. Rumors are rumors. You're all reading them. I'm reading them. I'm getting tweeted them. I'm getting texts. I'm getting calls. I'm reading these back room chat room boards, all of that. 
Here's the deal, Michigan people. I understand the theory of losing Carr opens the path for Dante Moore. Let me ask you this, though. If the rumors are true, and I don't know if they are or not, rumors are rumors. I am not reporting this as news. I am not reporting this as news. I'm reporting it as a rumor I hear 50 times a day, okay? If there are other factors other than Dante Moore genuinely navigating the recruiting process, if there are other things going on behind the scenes, other people involved looking for deals or NIL or what can you do for me besides just the kid and where he wants to go to school in the natural process, if any of that's involved, that doesn't help Michigan either. Teams like Michigan and Notre Dame are not known for their big NIL deals. So if that's a part of this and daddy's shopping for NIL money, I, I don't see how that puts Michigan in a better place than where they're at. Yeah, you might not have to worry about Notre Dame as much, but if that's what dad or anybody else involved behind the scenes is looking for, Michigan ain't spot either. He's going to go visit Texas A&M. Okay? So I don't know. And, and I don't know what's going to happen. And then it's going to be like, well, we didn't want car. We got more anyways. I don't know what's going to happen. But for tonight, if this goes the way it goes, it's a big win for Notre Dame. It's a big win for Notre Dame. Here's the deal. I saw an article a couple weeks ago. I think it was from One Foot Down saying, does Notre Dame need Dante Moore? And I really, I read that article and I thought about it. Does Notre Dame need Dante Moore? And I was reading it, thinking, processing it. Here's what I realized. Notre Dame doesn't need any quarterback with any specific name. They don't. What the early portion of the Marcus Freeman era needs to add the kicker and the fire accelerant to the already good recruiting is an elite, high-level potential quarterback that can help you recruit other guys. You could pitch these great wide receivers that we all need, and you could say, hey, meet our five-star elite-level quarterback. Okay? That's a big deal. Notre Dame needed that. Marcus Freeman needs that as a boost to the early part of his Notre Dame tenure. It's something Notre Dame, as in Kelly, could ever figure out. We've been chasing forever. Even when we get five-star guys, they don't work out for some reason. All the Brian Kelly stuff. All that Brian Kelly stuff that we went through, right? Marcus Freeman needs a high-end potential quarterback to help recruit. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. So did they need Dante Moore? Well, not necessarily, but you need an elite level quarterback. Now, I am not saying, what about Buckner? Like, no, I'm talking about guys now that could join. Obviously, we all hope Buckner does great, has a revolutionary year, develops a lot. We get to see him throw the ball all over, all that stuff, right? I'm talking about recruiting and guys coming in and maintaining the momentum Marcus Freeman and staff have built. That's what I'm talking about right now. So Notre Dame didn't need Dante Moore. They don't need Carr, but they do need an elite, elite potential level quarterback. Whatever that name is, the name's going to be. Dante Moore, Carr, somebody else. That's what Marcus Freeman needs for that early window of his tenure. Now, reclassification 24 to 23. I've seen a lot of people saying it's 24. He's not going to, to do that being 23. Either way though, either way, I've heard Carr plans on being very, very involved with recruiting other guys to Notre Dame. That's something that's been talked about, something he's comfortable doing, something he's excited doing. That is why it's a big deal to have a guy like this in the class this early. Okay, so even if it isn't 23, you could still pitch to these 23 receivers. Look at this guy coming in. Look at his tape. Look at him at the camps. Look at all that. We got a five-star guy that's going to be able to get you the ball. Get you the ball. And then you got that kid recruiting other kids. That's how this goes. So no, Notre Dame doesn't need Dante Moore. No, Notre Dame doesn't need Carr. But they need an elite, elite quarterback potential guy, whatever the name is. If it happens to be 
Lloyd Carr's grandson, it's just going to make me happier. Maybe next year, Bo Schembechler has a grandson and we could get him to play tight end or fullback or something, right? Bring it, okay? So I wasn't as concerned about the name. You need the talent, whatever guy it's going to be. So if this is the way it goes, beautiful. But I'm telling Michigan people right now, not as a troll. I do a lot of Michigan trolling because they deserve it. They deserve it. Okay, I do a lot of that. I am not trolling Michigan when I tell you. If the thing that went from Notre Dame thinking they were in the lead and almost wrapping this up with Dante, if the thing that got in the way of that was the pursuit of NIL type stuff, Michigan's in trouble on that. Because they're not, they're not, it isn't Texas A&M. It is in Oregon with Phil Knight, Nike money at Michigan. They're just not doing the same stuff. Okay. So if Michigan people are feeling better about all this because of that, you could be in for another disappointment. I don't know. You could be, or maybe Michigan does get Dante more. I don't know. But for now, all I know is I'm going to sleep a lot more soundly knowing all this great recruiting that's been going on so far is going to be added to with an elite ceiling quarterback and the floor should be pretty high too. Okay. So I hope Buckner balls out next year and all that stuff. I'm all for that. But for the future and the infancy stage of the Marcus Freeman era, this is beautiful. This is exactly what you want to see. Exactly what you want to see. So it's beautiful. The Michigan people are mad. They don't like me. They don't like us. They don't like the truth. They don't like facts. They don't like anything realistic. They don't like taking a hard look at their own situation. They don't. They just like to give you a game score from three years ago. Just a game score for three years ago. That's the only thing they have. It's like, I don't understand. Michigan had their best year in 20 years. How could we be struggling to get these recruits? I, I don't understand how that can happen. Your coach tried to leave your best year in 20 years. The coach said he didn't want to be there after it. And you're shocked that that's in kids' minds, that the guy didn't even want to be there after their best year in 20. And, oh, I don't know how these kids don't, don't want to come here. That's a good place to start, isn't it? So, I don't get it. Ferris says, Michigan fans don't hate ND. We must run in different social circles, Ferris, because almost every single one I've met hates me. Maybe they don't hate ND, but they hate me, and that's fine. That's totally fine. Totally fine, okay? So, they could say they don't hate Notre Dame, but every single one I've interacted with does. Everyone that's sending me threatening direct messages doesn't like Notre Dame. I can tell you that. The Michigan people didn't like it when I jumped into their uh, recruiting uh, spaces on Twitter the other night. They didn't like that. That ended, and I, I got whew, a lot of dirty words in the DMs after that one. Okay, so in different circles indeed. It must be different circles for sure. So... I don't know, but it's it's not a mystery to me. It's not a mystery to me that your coach didn't want. How could in one sentence you say, how can recruiting not be that that easy for us when we just finished our best year in 20? How is your next thought not? Hmm. Maybe the fact that the guy who led us to that season and got us there and beat Ohio State won the Big Ten not wanting to be here has something to do with that struggle. How they are not making that connection and blaming him for this, I don't get it. I don't get it. Did I see the fake Michigan account troll on EJ's recruiting chat? Yes, I did. It was the highlight of my week. Highlight of my week when that happened on that thread. It was beautiful. So I am ecstatic about this. It'll just make me sleep better tonight, knowing we have, have one of these considered to be elite quarterbacks in the fold for the early part of this era is a big damn deal. Ferris is saying, truth be told, CJ's 
a better fit for Notre Dame. I've heard some people say that. And I don't know if that is in regards to personality, like how he interacts with people, or maybe some, how do you judge good fit? Like to me, a guy who wants to jump in the class who's elite and wants to do it this far ahead, that is a good fit because he doesn't want to play games. Keep, draw his recruitment out all the way. That's a good fit because then he's in the mix. He's comfortable. You can rely on that. And then he could start recruiting other guys. That's beautiful. That is beautiful. Okay. So I just, uh, that's how I see it. So I don't know. Um, we got like 10 minutes until this happens. Let's take a phone call, shall we? Let's go to 618. 618, you're on the line. Who we got? Hi, th thank you for taking my call. I just had a quick question for you. Now, if this tonight goes think goes how we all think it's going to go, if you're Notre Dame and Marcus Freeman, do you still push just as hard for Dante Moore in the 23 class? That way you have two elite quarterbacks on the roster at the same time. Maybe do something like, uh, a, per se, red shirt car his freshman year. Then you have two years with Dante Moore. He leaves as a junior to go to the NFL. You take put C.J. Carr right in his spot, and at the same time, both of them are recruiting elite wide receivers to the school? In That's a great question, and that is like the number one thing I'm seeing debated on Notre Dame boards and, and on Twitter today. I think it makes perfect sense to recruit them both because they're in different classes, so that makes sense to me. What is the realistic chances you land both of these guys from Michigan in this dynamic back-to-back -back classes? What are the odds that you do that? I don't know if those odds are very good. I'm not saying it's nothing, and I've seen very mixed reviews on reports of whether Notre Dame's backing off, still on a full court press, still letting him know they're interested, but pulling back a little bit. Like, I've heard everything from they're still full on recruiting them to they totally backed off and everything in the middle. Um, but my personal thought is if they get Carr, I do think it lessens the chances of getting Dante more. I just think it does. I don't know if it technically should, but I just think it does. And I'm concerned if the rumors are true that people behind the scenes are searching for NIL deals because that's not Notre Dame's bag, literally. So, I don't know what to make of that, but wouldn't it be foolhardy not to keep recruiting them? Don't you think? I think so. Just like you said, I would go with a full court press. My only concern is, is if Notre Dame cools on Dante Moore, well, you're still recruiting wide receivers for the 23 class. And I like Tyler Buckner just as much. I hope he has a fantastic season, but do you get some of the pushback from the 23 wide receivers saying, Look, man, CJ Carr won't even be there until I'm a sophomore. And if he's not ready as a freshman, he will, he will not be ready as a quarterback until I'm a junior. I think you can spin this in that regard to say, even if it was Dante Moore, he would probably sit next year anyways. And then you're going to have Buckner. And then I think you can wrap this in where even though it's one more year out, it's still an elite level quarterback you're going to get to play with that would appeal to these elite wide receivers more than not having that. That's kind of the way I'm thinking about it. Like it's better than us doing what we have been where we're in limbo and have no quarterback to pitch to these great receivers. Um, I don't know. I'm just a little nervous from what I'm hearing about all the NIL stuff and, and other things behind the scenes that was making the Notre Dame staff nervous. Cars a sure thing. Like I can't blame, blame the staff for going this route, jumping on this sure thing, taking it. And then if, if you got Dante Moore and this guy and pull them both out of Michigan this year, Freeman's first year, I'm, I won't even be around to enjoy on the field. I'll probably die of being too happy if that happened. I just don't know if it's realistic. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. I'm not sure if it's realistic. It's just one of those things. I don't I, – I, I'm like every other Notre Dame fan. I want to look ahead like C.J. in the class of 24. Do you put the pressure – if you let's say Notre Dame – 
TJ Carr signs in 15 minutes and he says, I'm going to Notre Dame. And you cool on Dante Moore. Do you, and Buckner has an okay year. Notre Dame still wins 10 games, but he's not the wow Tyler Buckner that we thought he could be. Then do you put the pressure on CJ Carr to reclassify to the 23 class? I think no matter what, it's Buckner's year next year. No matter who it would be. Okay. I think it's Buckner's year next year. And I think that honestly, you get you owe it to everybody involved, including all of us and Buckner. You got to give him this year and let him see what happens. Um, even if Dante Moore was there next year, I still think it would be Buckner. And so I don't think it would have been that immediate. And in that regard, that that's how I think you shape this. And you use car, you could still use car to recruit 23 guys. He just might not know them as well as guys in his class that are at those camps. Um, so I would be shocked if Notre Dame landed both of these guys. I would just be shocked. I'm not saying not to try. And the other thing is they've given Dante Moore all these months to say, if you want to commit, commit. And he didn't. So Notre Dame wouldn't get a wait around anymore. So they got a guy and they like who they got. If Dante wants to jump in, you make a spot for him. No big deal. So that's how I see it. But I'd be shocked if they got both. I, I just would. I A lot of these top level quarterbacks don't stack like that. So it would shock me in a good way if we got both. If we don't get Dante Moore, I'm really interested to see where he ends up. I don't know how that's going to go. Where do you think he would end up? Uh, all the things I read, if he doesn't end up at Notre Dame, if, if he really is chasing NIL money, and I have heard the same backdoor things that you have, that there's outside forces trying to push him to go a certain direction. And if, if it's really money that he is after or somebody in his family's after, I, I would think it's a, it's a Texas school in the SEC. And, I mean, I know you have Texas and Oklahoma joining the SEC, but I, I've heard a lot on Texas A&M putting a big push on him. And, obviously, we saw with this year's recruiting class what kind of money they're throwing out for NIL deals. So, if it's, if it's money he's truly after – for NIL deals, I would say he ends up at Texas a That's what I would think too. Um, and then Michigan does have other options. It, what a coincidence. Right after all this news broke, oh, they got a magic crystal ball for another good kid in the 20, the next class. Like they're always going to come up with something. But if he doesn't end up in Notre Dame, I don't want him to end up in Michigan either just because it'll make them more mad. So I hope he takes the money and goes somewhere else, leaves the state. Like, but I don't want to be greedy here, I guess is my overall point. My number one priority was providing Freeman with an elite level quarterback to help be a turning point of what he's building early. If it's one class off, I can live with it. You're still going to have that guy that we need and we've been missing. We haven't recruited. We haven't developed. We haven't found. We haven't transfer portaled, whatever it is. I don't care the name. Marcus Freeman needs an elite potential signal caller. This could be it. Everybody said he looked way better than advertised at the camps. So I don't know. I'm, I'm excited though. But if he didn't, if, could you imagine if we got both? I couldn't even imagine that. It just seems so far-fetched to me to be able to pull that off. That seems like a tough ask. Well, and that's what I'm trying to think back. Now, I'm only 29, so I've been watching Notre Dame religiously for probably 25 years and I'm trying to remember a, a one-two punch like that like back-to-back -back years where you just get one of the best quarterbacks in the class and I can't think of I mean we left Brady Quinn left and we met, went immediately into Jimmy Clawson but I cannot think of anything where it was just bang bang one right after the next top five quarter top uh, five star quarterbacks yeah i i just think it's critically important to secure one and dante's had all this time to jump in make his commitment if he wanted to he didn't staff was sit away sit sick of waiting around this guy's a sure thing you take it and then the chips fall with dante where they fall um and the other thing i want to mention about this that's a big deal to me 
if indeed it's true, again, I don't want to put false rumors out there. I don't know whether it's true or not. But if it's true that it's the money behind the scenes impacting this, there's not really much the staff could do because Notre Dame's never going to do it the Texas A&M way. They're never going to, and I don't want them to. So if that's in play, the staff didn't do anything wrong. I can't blame them for that. That's beyond their control to a large extent, right? Yeah, yeah, and I mean, even and if you're looking that far forward, isn't Texas A&M on the schedule in, I can't remember if it's 24 or 25. So if Dante really does chase the money and ends up signing with Texas A&M, and like you said, I can't blame him for that. Notre Dame isn't going to and doesn't want to do it that way. They want to do it their way, and I appreciate that. But wouldn't it be ironic if he comes into South Bend and Notre Dame just blows them out with all their five-star bought players, per se? Yeah, that it is going to be interesting. You're not misremembering that. Texas A&M is on the schedule in a, in a few years. And then I believe after them, Alabama's on the schedule as well when you kick the can down the road and look at look at some of those schedules. So I think what does it hurt to keep in touch with Dante Moore? It's just that you don't have the same amount of pressure now because you know you have what's considered to be a five-star talent committed. So this is like free rolling to me because you already got a guy that you know is going to be there. And then you could go ahead and keep recruiting him. Why not? And if you don't get him, you don't have that pressure. And it's not going to be like you totally struck out because you're going to have Carr. Even if he doesn't reclassify, this is a huge win no matter what. Yeah, I agree 100%, and I'm really looking forward to the commitment. Thanks for taking my call and go Irish. No problem. Thanks for calling. Take care down there in Carbondale. SIU, baby. No, I'm an Evansville fan. I grew up in Evansville. I got I got to ride with the Aces. Gotcha. I'm going off your, your caller ID here. It says Carbondale, 618. Yeah, I live in Southern Illinois. I just grew up. My wife is... I live in Southern Illinois, but I grew up in Southern Indiana and uh, Evansville territory is, is where I'm from. Gotcha. Beautiful. Well, call again, my friend. Thanks a lot. Enjoy the evening. Thanks. Ab- Thanks. You too. Take care. All right. Let's see what we got. I'm going to pull up the screen here. I see a guy talking. I do not think I have the ability through StreamYard to loop in the live commitment in here. I don't think I can. So I'm paying attention to it on the screen here. What else do we got in the comments? Spend all that money. Eight and four won't cut it this year. The pressure's on Jimbo to win. It's tough. Kirby's jock strap, <laughs> which is a great name, by the way. That's a great moniker. Um, the pressure's on for sure, because once it gets out that you're doing all that and getting these guys in the way that People are alleging then the pressure's on to win. He's in a tough conference to try and win it all, just like the Bayou Bango Brian Kelly is. And that's the other thing we need to mention. Everybody involved here, 300-something people watching, all the people on the chat, here's what you all need to know. None of this is happening if Brian Kelly's here. You all know that, right? Everybody knows that. None of this is happening. None of this off-season excitement's happening. None of this quarterback stuff's happening. It ain't. It ain't happening. Here we go. I see him on the screen smiling there. Now CBS is going to go to uh, probably a bunch of commercials, j- just like it's a golf tournament on CBS. Geico, I got a lizard on the screen. So, I don't know. This is going to be very, very interesting. Timothy Adams. Let's see. This looks like a good point. Let's put it up. I hope ND fans keep perspective in Freeman's record the next few years. Holtz was five and six first season, regardless of who the QB is, doesn't care how many stars, all that. Listen, I've been saying that. I've been saying that too. And I don't know if people are going to listen because they all want results right away. And I've been saying, you got to realize it's year one. He's got to learn how to be a head coach, get comfortable with all that. Timothy, thanks for the comment. He's got to get comfortable with all that. Here's the other thing. I'm glad you brought that up. I always go through this with people. 
and I don't understand it. Oh, I want Brian Kelly out of Notre Dame. He's not recruiting hard enough. You know, I, I want him out of here, all that. Now you got what you wanted. The new guy comes in and you expect him to win all the games right now with the talent you said wasn't good enough because of the old guy. You don't really get to have both. If you wanted Kelly gone because he's not recruiting hard enough, you can't expect the new guy to win all of his games with those guys. Give him a year or two. Give him a year or two. I'm not going to freak out over anything that happens this next year. I'm just not. I'm not. Okay? There is learning this new staff, how they're all going to gel. Marcus Freeman being comfortable being a head coach. All these guys together. You have a new quarterback, by the way. You have a new quarterback. You got to make sure he stays upright, healthy, and develops well. There's a lot of things that go into this. Tough game against the top three national team week one out of the gates. There's a lot going on. There's a lot going on. What a nice looking family. You would never know they're Michigan people. Look at these people. They look too nice to be from there. Way too nice. Here we go. I don't have the volume on because it would ruin what I'm doing as I'm talking. You think all these coaches are going to stick around South Bend for four to five years? Here's my thought. Tommy Reese, no. Most of the other ones, yes. That's my honest answer. I think that's a really good question. Um, but that would be my guess. Would be Tommy Reese does something in the NFL. Most of the other guys stick around. I don't think Al Golden's looking for another head job. Harry ain't going anywhere. Al Washington's new. He's recruiting his face off right now. Beautiful. So I think that's all looking good. Let's see. What's he saying? Somebody type in what he's saying. I just see a lot of smiling. I'm waiting to see an a interlocking ND hat. Lloyd Carr was an overrated coach anyway. Go Irish. Well, maybe his grandson agrees, wants to get out of town. You know what, though? Give this kid a break. Maybe he doesn't want to live in that shadow, wants to create his own legacy, not be compared to the family name. All that stuff's perfectly legitimate. Perfectly legitimate. And I've been a guy who gives Tommy Reese a hard time over the years. This kid loves Tommy Reese. This family loves Tommy Reese. All the recruits love Tommy Reese. People like me give them a hard time. All these recruits love them. They all love them. Oh, come on, CJ. Just say it. Carr was a decent coach. Not great. I'm just telling you, I got a, a feeling about Freeman. And I just think he's too smart to not learn how to be a good head coach. He has been around too much good football and too many good football programs. <laughs> Here we go. That's what I'm talking about. Let's go. Yes. I love it. Let's go. It's official. It's official. Well, not really, because it's just a verbal. That's the other thing. What if he did all this and then right when it comes to signing day, flips to Michigan? Biggest troll ever. But there it is. You love to see it. I'm telling you guys. My blood pressure just went down 50 freaking points from this. Just because I could sleep easy knowing, knowing that we have this guy. Oh, look, they got Brady Quinn on there. He might know a little something about being a Notre Dame quarterback. I don't know. Maybe. Look at him. You got to get that guy in the Notre Dame NBC booth. He's too damn good looking to be doing all this other stuff. Put him up in the NBC booth. Oh, this is so beautiful. My blood pressure. I just feel like a million pounds of pressure's just been lifted off me. All right, I'm going to minimize that. Going back to the phone lines now, let's get some reaction. Oh, I think I know who this is. JD, is this you? Yes, sir. What's up, John? What's oh, up, man? The hell yeah. This is exciting. I was watching on, was watching on my tablet. This is exciting. So what do you make of all this, J.D.? By the way, it was great seeing you at the uh, the Blue and Gold uh, Players Club party. That was fantastic. I had a great time with you guys. What do you think of this flip from all the obsession of Dante Moore and then now it's somebody else, but he's a great player? What do you make of this? Oh, I, I'd love him, Carl. I mean, the best thing is 
the kid wants to come to Notre Dame and is excited for Notre Dame. I think that's the best part. It's not like a five-star quarterback, oh, I only had one choice left, I chose Notre Dame. No, this kid wants to go to Notre Dame. And I think as fans, we've been hyping up, you know, Dante, and I think we still keep doing that. But we've been like, you know, everyone's on Twitter with Dante liking this. I think we need to show some love to Carr. you got a kid now wanting to come to Notre Dame, wanting to be excited for Notre Dame, wanting to bring players to Notre Dame. That's why I think he came in early. So he sounded like he wants to recruit players to Notre Dame. So I think as definitely as fans, we definitely got to show that, you know, that boy some love because uh, I think he's going to be huge for us. Yeah. And there is something to be said for like you mentioning him knowing he wants to be here and wanting to do it early and all that. That that just hits you right, you know, because it shows you don't want to play games. You don't want to play the field. You're committed. You want to be all in. And the sooner he's all in, the sooner he could start recruiting and pitching to other great players. That's the best part of this. Exactly. Yep. And I think we still go after more because Alabama, everybody else has five stars after every year, stuff like that. And the kid is too. So Carl went into this thinking Dante's going to come to Notre Dame spot so he's one he's not even scared of competition and two he's i mean you can just tell he's ready to play yeah and so where do you think if you had to guess what do you think happens with dante Moore? where do you think he's going to end up and why um i think depending on how soon it goes but i think if it does go into the year everyone's kind of like oh the farther it goes back the worse i think it's actually going to be a little bit of a positive i think if Notre Dame comes out and we're throwing the ball a lot more and Buckner has a couple great games, we go in the shoot and we will win that game. And when we go out there and do those games like that, more might have that, Hey, hundred percent. I'm going there. They're throwing the ball more. It's not the, they're going to run it every single play. I'm not saying we shouldn't run the ball, but I really think some people are like, Oh, the farther it goes out, the worse it's going to be. I, I kind of think it might help us because uh, I think this offense is going to get clicking and Buckner's just going to start rolling. And I think that might actually push more to us later on. If he commits in the next – right before the season starts, I mean, I I think it's between us and Texas A&M. And Texas A&M for the, Texas A&M is for the money. And I think Notre Dame will be the school he chooses because he wants to be there and, you know, fell in love with the school. I just – I don't want to get greedy here. I just think you're expecting – if you were a Notre Dame fan expecting to get both of these guys, I just think that's a tough ask. Listen, I'm not putting anything past Marcus Freeman and this staff for sure. For sure. I just, I don't know. And it's just hard to tell. And you read all the rumors and the chat boards and the backroom boards and all that. I don't know what to make of it, but I feel a lot better now with whatever's going to happen, knowing we have this guy. It's beautiful. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I think too is, and I'm, you've kind of talked about this on your episodes and, and on Twitter and stuff, you know, we got to give time for Marcus. He hasn't really had a relationship, especially with the offensive players. Like, if Dante Moore was the linebacker, I'd be like, okay, we should have had him. Like, you know, what's going on? This is an offensive player, and, you know, Freeman could be bringing him in. I'm, you know, 2025 20, kids right now they're working on, you know, for recruiting. So, it, recruiting takes, from you know, a lot of years, you know, way back to be doing it. So, I think once, you know, he's in there for a little bit longer, I'm expecting all this excitement later on the next couple of years. I can't believe we're getting spoiled now with what we're getting now. I can't imagine what the classes are going to be like in 2024, 2025, that's when, you know, it comes down to two five-star quarterbacks. That's when we really be like, oh, yeah, we're going to get these get these two because the relationship that Marcus has built with them and the system they've all now running and the coaches and everything. So it's just going to get better. Yeah, and, and the <clears throat> with these quarterbacks, yeah, I mean, it's no doubt Notre Dame needs to improve the skill positions, wide receiver room. We have all these complaints. We know that it's been a struggle. I can't think of a better way to recruit that caliber of that position player to your school than saying, why don't you talk to our five-star guy that you could see and know he's going to be able to throw you the ball. And and I'm not saying Buckner won't end up being that, but I mean, there's two separate things, what you already have going on now and the future. And so to be able to have this guy recruiting for you this early, even if he doesn't reclassify is a win. That is an extra big recruiting push for an operation that's already doing great in that area. You love to see it. The arrow's pointing straight up for this program in a way that it hasn't in 20 years, at least longer than that. Do you agree? Oh, yeah. 
hundred percent. And the excitement, I, I can't tell you the last time I've been this excited for Notre Dame and just, yeah, I mean, the season cannot start soon enough, but just everything that's going around, it's all coming together and uh, it's just going up. Like you said, it's a hundred percent going up and I can't, I mean, I'm excited to be on the ride for it. And I just hope, man, it just, it's, we've been waiting for this, uh, you know, for a long time and I'm finally glad it's going to happen. But JD, here's the big thing is I have waited forever. I have waited forever to feel that Notre Dame was recruiting the way I always felt that they had to, to get this in a position to have a chance to win these playoff games. What we're seeing now from this staff is going to give you that chance. Talent is not going to be the thing holding Notre Dame back from their dreams and goals as we move further along. It's not. There is going to be talent. It all just has to come together. Staff comes together. Freeman gets comfortable and confident as the head guy. Keep the recruiting going. Like you could just kind of see a light at the end of the tunnel that, that I didn't see before under Kelly. There was no light at the end of the tunnel. So you said what, like under the tunnel, you said? Yeah, I said under Kelly, where was that light? It was just, you better win now because we don't know. Now it's just legitimate potential because of all the talent they're accumulating. It's beautiful. Oh, yeah. I mean, we, I mean, it can be, it's, it's the ceiling is, you know, it's anything for us. I mean, it's, it's all up from here. You got, I mean, had the, what last, what, mostly three stars and we've been going 10 and two. Now we're going to switch that instead of when I've got four stars and five stars and we're going to have kids that also that are four stars and five stars wanting to play for their coach, wanting to win, being part of a program that's, you know, wanting to win and a fan base that's excited and energized. And I mean, it's all just going to come together. And I just, I mean, it's just going to be so great. Now, let me ask you this. I have to ask you this. I'm a Notre Dame fan and you know that, but I got to ask you. Yep. I'm not ignoring that you said we were going to go in the horseshoe and win. So I have a, reporter's obligation here to ask you if Notre Dame goes in the horseshoe and beats Ohio state, how would that happen to you? Like if they beat them, how do we get to that point and what needs to happen in that ball game to get Notre Dame over them in week one? How would you see that playing out if we won? Absolutely. They started that at the Oklahoma state game. That's, I don't, I'm just saying this is not this old, oh, this is good. He knows it. No, that's nothing. I'm just kind of guessing the way I watched the game. John, I watched that game and I watched in the second half where Jack Cohen had a size of probably mean you could drive our car through a hole to run up the middle. I mean, that thing was huge from what I could tell him, you know, watching the game. Why did we not put Tyler Buckner in? Maybe Marcus was like, we're not playing Buckner at all. I don't want to show Ohio State nothing. Next year, he just wanted to come in there, coach these boys. He coached to win. But he also just kind of let, you know, that year to go, you know, let those boys finish off, everybody, get, you know, all the chaos and everything, and then really hit it this year. You know, they didn't show – I mean, Tyler Buckner was hurt, so we didn't see him for the spring game. Nothing now Ohio State has on them, more film. Yeah. We also had it where, um, you know, the spring game, let's separate the teams they did. Okay, that now shows Ohio State nothing. We don't have any – start. like, they don't know who's starting. They don't know if it's like the first team and second team. They don't know none of that. So there's that kind of thing right there. They're not showing him nothing. As a new defensive coordinator, he's going to throw something new that Ohio State hasn't seen. I think the difference in that game is going to be Notre Dame's defensive line. If we pressure the quarterback, I don't care how fast the receivers are, how good they are, he can't see to throw them, that ball is going out of bounds. That ball is going to go a little low. It's going to go a little high. That's how we're going to do it. Now, the kicking game, still kind of worried about that for us. But I think Buckner comes out. Shines on that. I think we need two or two turnovers on defense. I think we can get that this year with this defense, and we're going to win the game. I'm not saying we're going to win the game by 20. We might win with, you know, last scoring touchdown. But I, I just telling you, it's going to come down to the Notre Dame, Notre Dame defensive line will be the difference maker in that game. That's a very, very good perspective, JD, and I hope you are right. But uh, thank you for calling and tell your lovely family I said hello, okay? Yes, I will, John. Appreciate it. Take oh, care. We'll see you soon, JD. Hey, see you, John. Bye. Bye. Now, I got to tell you guys something. There's something going on in this chat thread right now that I don't understand and we got to talk about. I don't get it. 
I got a bunch of people in this thread that are like, I think they're legitimate Michigan people that are like, we don't hate Notre Dame and we don't have anything against you. What is this? What is happening? How can every Michigan fan on Twitter hate me and tell me to kill myself? And then I do this and I got people in here that are like, I don't have anything against, uh, against Notre Dame. I don't get that. Oh, geez. So I don't know. Maybe we just have some different, uh, different groups going on here, but that is hilarious. Uh, Notre Dame dude, 88. I want Jason Moore on my list too. Trust me. Uh, who else do we have here? Five, seven, four. That's local to Notre Dame, I believe. Five, seven, four. Who we got? Hey, John, this is a Notre Dame dude, 88. How you doing this evening? What's going on? Thanks for calling. What's on your mind? Oh, a whole bunch of stuff. I know the topic is mostly recruiting today, but the thing that I'm thinking about the most, having so many people in your chat, is just to see if we can get as many Notre Dame fans to invade Columbus. And um, I'm just trying to get on every show possible from now until kickoff. Just try to promote that. And I'm just asking everybody. I know the economy's nuts, gas is nuts, but ND Nation, let's green out Columbus. And you know uh, what? We need your help. That's hey, I've had, some, for, man. I've had some people ask if I'm going. I've had some people invite me to go. I have some family friends that live out there that are Ohio State people. They invited me to go. I just don't feel like I'm going to be very welcome there. That could be a long day for me. I, I don't know if that's a good idea or not, but I think there is a decent contingent that want to go. Um, but but I don't, it's yeah. going to be wild, the night game and everything. Well, I mean, I think you get, you know, we bring the, the Notre Dame love. You know, we get enough of us together. I mean, you're going to have the hostile crowd. You, you can't control that, you know. But uh, I think we just go try to make a presence. And uh, just another question, John, when's the last time we've been this excited in the off season, uh, just about the team in general? I mean, we've always been upbeat with the you know, double digit win seasons consistently, but just the buzz is just so much fun. It's just, it's amazing. You know, it's, I do you not. Know, I was saying before, you, you can't wait to see what else happens. But it's amazing. This is the traditional time of year where it's like a recruiting kind of downtime. It's the dog days of summer. Everything kind of bottoms out. That's not happening. There's so much excitement. I've never seen the volume of excitement. People interested in recruiting, engaging on Twitter, social media. The YouTube numbers are solid for a time of year where they go down for everybody because there isn't that much happening. The interest is high. The vibe is high. The morale's high. The energy's high. It's all good. For once, it's all good. And it just starts at the top. When you're genuine, like Marcus is, you bring that family aspect. It, and it's just a genuine thing. Um, I'll give you a little inside piece. Um, just talking to other head coaches on campus, like our fencing coach, volleyball coach. Um, we had these head coaching meetings. And uh, 11 years, Brian was there. He never attended one of them. Marcus goes to these all the time. So for like lower level coaches, and not even say they're lower level, our fencing coaches, you know, that'd be one win Natty. Uh, you know, he shares with us that he talks to Marcus all the time. And it's just little things like that. It's just, it's huge. You know, you see him out at the soccer game. You see him out at men's lacrosse, women's lacrosse. Chip, is this, is this Chip? Is this you, Chip? Is this you? Sure is, man. I thought it was you. I I heard your voice. I'm like, but you said ND, dude, whatever. I'm like, no, that's my guy, Chip, man. I got, hey. That's my, uh, went off my YouTube name, you know? My YouTube uh, chat name is ND Dude 88 I thought so. I had that in my mind. This is, uh, this is at Stadium Dude if you're a Twitter person. Gotcha. Perfect. Hey, by the way, I'm going to come back to campus soon. I'll let you and Cam know, and we'll come do everything, bring you out to lunch. But I got to get back soon this summer. I'm in a good mood. I want to get back to campus. Oh, yeah, man. I'm going to be lifting this up. Probably July. Yeah, good, Sometime in July, I'm going to come. Thanks, I'll hit man. you guys up. Um, hey, Chip. Well, after the con- yeah, what's up? Let me ask you this. Why was I seeing those rumors that Notre Dame's going back to real grass when the real story is they're just redoing the, the turf, right? No, that's that's 100%. Um, we're just getting new uh, turf. I mean, the internet's the internet, you know? If yeah. You, you hear something, it just goes, you know? Um, 
but the whole grass thing, I mean, I know that was a traditional thing that everybody loved and missed. And I, I'll be honest, I took it when I was younger, personal, when the field was failing and we were going to lose it. But, you know, honestly, it's just there's things above what groundskeepers can do and an institution has to invest substructure-wise and want to do it. And with our climate, it was just time to go to a modern surface that's consistent and fast. So this July, after Billy Joe, we're going to be resurfaced the whole field, get a brand new turf. Um, it's going to be exciting. Uh, we are getting a new grass practice field. If you're over on campus, you might see some construction. That's going to be completed too. That's going to be a football grass practice field. Uh, you know, our women's lacrosse team might use that as well, but that is, we are getting a new grass practice field. Beautiful. Um, well, Chip, thanks for calling. I'll let you know when I'm going to come back to campus. We'll meet up. Tell your kids I said hi. I will do about the park, man. Join the fence. Go Irish, man. Beautiful. Thanks for calling, Chippy. We'll see you. See you, buddy. Later. Peace. So for those of you that didn't catch on to all that, that's Chip. He's one of the Notre Dame uh, Stadium grounds guys. It's beautiful. I having a guy like that, and he's like, oh, John, come by. You can come run on the field. It's beautiful. I love Chippy. Who we got? Five, seven, four... Again, this has got to be Mason. Is it Mason? Hello? John, what's up? What up? Nothing. Just watch, just watch the announcement, dude. I was pumped. I was kind of watching your reaction, too, at the same time. What do you think of all this? How quick things change? And it was all Dante, Dante, Dante. Now it's car, car, car. What do you make of all this dynamic? It's strange for sure, but what I've kind of come to terms with is that you have the sure thing in CJ Carr, which came to fruition recently, but I was listening to what Steve Wolfong was just saying. It sounds like he's wanted to commit for months, like since last spring. So you don't take a guy that early. You want to see a sophomore film still, but you take the sure thing. And I think it's a good thing to be greedy. It's a good position to be in for Notre Dame, of course, but you can't take the chance on not accepting cars. You still want more. And what if you end up with neither, you know? So you end right. up with, with car who, I mean, there's still rumblings. He could reclassify it. So everything could be all right. Yeah. And that's what I think it comes down to is you need one of these type of guys for the early window of the Freeman era. This was a guy saying, I'm not playing games. I'm not interested in all that. I just want to be your guy. Fine. I have no problem with it. I didn't care the name. You just need one of them. You like, like an elite guy. I don't care the name. And I think maybe you have that and it's making my blood pressure go down now. No, right. No, you're right. I, I heard earlier you were saying that, you know, you don't need to get a stud in every single class. And I've always subscribed to the theory that you need a guy in every other class so that you don't have a stack up. So, you know, this class would be the right one to get one in Dante. But what if CJ, you know, if he reclassifies, but you know, I'm not totally done with the whole Angeli thing, too. I really liked what I saw him in, in the blue and gold game. So um, I think he's kind of gotten overlooked. I, I'm done with Pine. I don't think Pine has a future at Notre Dame, unfortunately. I think there's a lot of Pine truthers. I'm not one of them. I, I'm still a big believer in Buckner, but the quarterback room's exciting for once. It's not just a bunch of three-star guys and, you know, Brendan Clarks and Ian Books of the world coming out of high school that you don't believe in already. Right. Well, exactly. But let me ask this. When you when you're when these people were talking and earlier before you opt in, I had a call and they were asking about what are the odds of Dante and Carr. Here's the issue though. With the way you can transfer out now and move around, what are the odds that the guy who isn't the starter when they're both there sticks around and doesn't just go to play right away somewhere? What are the odds of that in the new dynamic of college football? That's my question. It's, I mean, everything's on the table, it seems like, you know, so, you know, you bring a guy in and like I always say, when you, when you have me on, you know, the webcam shows, John, is that a, a verbal commitment is, is just that it's just essentially naming a leader. So I don't know, this whole thing is just so crazy. It's so easy to just transfer out, you know, you don't win the job and you're gone. So even if you do stack up all these guys, it doesn't mean anything until he's on the field winning you games. So uh, Notre Dame's in a, in a great spot right now. You bring in all the talent that you can and just let it sort itself out. You don't turn down a guy like C.J. Carr. I've, I've heard people 
I have people in my DMs earlier. Why are we accepting CJ Carr? Every, you know, all the eggs being a Dante Moore basket. As if you t- when you, if you told somebody Notre Dame is going to get a five star quarterback, you're going to say no, no. I can't get. I cannot subscribe to that at all. I mean, then you're really playing with fire. And since when is Notre Dame of all programs, especially with our recent lack of elite quarterback history? Where are we in the position to sit there and be picky about five-star guys that want to come here? You know? That's where I'm at. Yeah. I think you have to be there. Like, and the staff has given Dante Moore all these months at any time. He could have said, I'm done visiting 90 places. I'm done with the duck at Oregon. I'm done doing all this. I'm your guy. And then you don't know what would happen after that. He had the chance to do that. Didn't do it for whatever reason. They're taking the sure thing, and it and it makes me feel fine. I'm fine with it. No doubt. And the more I read into it, the more I kind of think the dad is the issue. You know, I think Dante wants a certain thing, and his dad wants – or family wants other things. So hearing this all shake out and hearing the guy – you know, I, I'm decently plugged in, but hearing the guys like Wolf Hong and Loy and Singer and all these guys that – are really, really, really plugged into the situation. Hearing the info that they're able to drop now that Carr is committed to Notre Dame is going to be really interesting. So we're going to learn a lot more about Dante Moore here in the next 24 to 48 hours. You you think so? Just just because now this has happened, more stuff can kind of come out that wasn't known before is what you're kind of hinting at? Yeah, essentially. I think it's uh, they're, they feel more open to being able to talk about the, co- the car and more situation you know more openly rather than saying you know these guys have known that more was committed or i'm sorry that car was committed to Notre Dame since this past saturday or even before then so you know now that rather than saying oh i think car is committed to Notre Dame you can say he is now you know it, you have to watch the being a recruiting guy myself or you know i used to be on the beat that yep you, you have to be careful the way you word things and when you get to know these guys well enough the way that they word things tells you everything that actually makes perfect sense. And that's probably a nuanced thing that you would catch more of if you're in that business. That makes perfect sense. Um, Mason, let me yes, ask, sir. let me ask you this since I got you on the line. You alluded a few minutes ago that this is a relationship that's been around a while and that this guy's like Notre Dame a while. What is the root of that relationship? I I heard he's close with Tommy and loves Reese, but like how does a guy with that name and that Michigan lineage end up drifting and building that good of a relationship with Notre Dame? I'm genuinely interested. Do you, do you know? So for just, just from what I heard from Steve Wolfong, I don't know the kid personally, like I used to in these classes when I was, you know, I was getting paid to cover recruiting, but just from what he was saying was that, you know, Notre Dame was a school he was interested in. The proximity is the thing. The faith is a major factor. I was not aware of, and then he visited campus for the first time and fell in love with it. And then his family kind of coerced him to, you know, take other visits and, you know, make sure this is a spot for you. But, you know, he would leave Notre Dame every time just saying how in love with campus he is. You know, he, he knew after his first visit, that's where he wanted to be. Those are his words, not mine. So he knew where he wanted to be, but he did his due diligence, which I absolutely respect. You know, you see guys that get on campus like, oh, this is where I want to be. And then you, they kind of back off of it. But CJ did his due due diligence and just from his quotes, you know, I was concerned that Tommy's not going to be around until 2024, 2025. So it seems to me that, you know, even though they do have a great special relationship that CJ will still be around at that point. And it's more about Notre Dame and not committing to a coach, which I would never recommend because I think Tommy Reese is in line for an NFL job here in the next year or two, but maybe CJ Carr convinces him, to stay you know i really think their relationship is special that makes sense and the i really like when you say a kid visited campus and then got that feel of like this is home that like instant comfort yeah. that feel that like all of us in our friend circle have for notre dame that feeling of like peace and at home and comfort and there's just like this warmth around it like that natural comfort you can't fake that. You can't build that. You can't learn that. And if that hit him that early, that isn't something I can measure on the field, but it matters to me. And I love having that dynamic from the quarterback. I do. No, it's a big thing. And, you know, he was saying he wants to 
number one class in 2023 and 2024, and Notre Dame's in a good spot. I don't think they're going to finish there, but you know that's a, that's certainly a high goal and something I, I'd like for them to strive for. You know, if you can get top five classes in 2023 and 2024, the future is looking very, very bright. Yeah, and the other part of this is I was reading today. It seems like Carr wants to be very aggressive in helping yeah. recruit kind of the way Blake Fisher was like the captain of the players recruiting for that class. It seems like he really wants to get involved with that. And if I want anybody on the team to be doing it in a class, it's the top end quarterback. Cause he could go tell those receivers yeah. come here and I will throw it to you. I promise. I love that dynamic. Love it. Well, you can't script it any better. It, oh, you got the five-star quarterback committed in your class and he's coming after recruits. I mean, that's exactly what you want. Now, let me ask this. And this came up, I think, before you were, you were on here. And I want to know what you think about this. How much is the difference between Dante Moore being in this class and being able to recruit skill guys, maybe some of them for 23, you know, right now? How different is that to us getting a commitment from a guy one further year out and his ability to immediately start doing that. Is there a huge gap there just because of the one year? Or do you think that's not that big of a deal and it's just five-star quarterback that's going to carry weight even if it's a year out? I don't think it's a huge deal. It sounds like CJ has relationships in the 2023 class. Obviously, he has great ones in the 2024 class, guys. He's gotten to know playing on his own team, but also seven on seven, you know, camp circuits around the country. Uh, but yeah, you know, guys are attracted to good quarterback play, especially skill positions. So, be, you know, being able to have that confidence in, like you said, Hey, I'm going to be the guy throwing you the ball. Like let's go to South Bend and do this thing. I don't think it's that different. And Dante, you know, he talked about recruiting guys, you know, I want to bring these guys with me or whatever, but why would you do it in a way like CJ did where you committed so early that you can have a huge impact on the class. You know, I feel like a lot of receivers are kind of waiting to make their decision to see what Notre Dame's going to do at quarterback. But if you really cared that much about getting the best class possible, I understand doing your due diligence, but Dante's drugged this thing out for so long that do you really want the best guys in the class with you? Because you're a key cog in this whole machine and you're kind of clogging it all up. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. I got a, I got technical technician here, Mason. He just put on here. I think I see John's hairline coming back to life in real time. Thank you, CJ Carr. <laughs> I love it. Me hey, too. John, I'm about to eat some dinner. I'm going to hop off here, but I'll keep you on the TV. Beautiful. Thanks. Enjoy your dinner, man. Thanks for calling. Yeah, of course. Thanks, John. Take care. Have a good night. Oh, man. So... Good night for us, but since I've been doing this, I haven't been on Twitter. What are the Michigan people saying? Are any of you guys in the chat on Twitter? What are they saying? They got anything to say or they all just checked out? Just wondering. We got a 219 here. That's probably what? Right across the border. What is 219? Gary, right across the Illinois border? Who we got, 219? Island. Highland, Indiana, Pete, uh, Pete. So I was close. Highland's right across the border, right? Highland is in Lake County. Gotcha. Okay. So what's up, Pete? Thanks for calling. What's on your mind? Uh, I love listening and watching your show. Um, yeah, I'm with you. I always love uh, sticking it to Michigan. It's a great feeling as an Irish fan. It just means more. There, the SEC's phrase. It just means more. Whenever something happens that's good for us, bad for them, it's a great day for me. I'm sorry. It's just who I am, and I'm not going to grow out of it. I saw a guy on YouTube uh, yesterday who was basically really getting sick uh, seeing that we could that we could get CJ Carr and still possibly Dante Moore right out of their backyard. And I figured I'd tell you about this so maybe you could watch it and Love it even more. Who's it by? Who's the content creator? I will look right now. But also a question for you. What would you enjoy more in the playoffs? Beating Bayou Bengal Bryan or beating Michigan? Oh, my God. That is like one of the best questions I've ever been asked. Ever. That That's a terrific question. Here's what I think I'll say. On that one, 
I think you have to go LSU and Brian Kelly because the dynamic is so incestuous that I think it's important for you to show that he left and you're better than him because of it and not the other way around. So for all my Michigan hatred and all that, this is almost more like a family argument when it comes to Brian Kelly and Notre Dame. So on that one, it's just, it hits a little too close to home. And so I would have to go with, I would Brian Kelly and LSU for sure. Cause it's like your dad starting a new family and then <laughs> saying that my new family's better than you. No, like I, so for me, it would have to be that, but that's amazing for me to get to that point to pick something over Michigan. I have to, because you just, you have to let it be known Kelly left saying Notre Dame made it impossible for him to do more. We have to prove that that's wrong. And he's the one who self-imposed the blockades that made it hard for him to get over the hump. So I got to go Kelly LSU on that one. Terrific question. One of the best ones I've been asked. Now, this seems like an obvious one too. If LSU were to come to play in South Bend, you would definitely be booing Brian Kelly then. Am I correct? Oh my God. I don't, I don't even, I can't even imagine what that would be like. If he, it was awkward enough when he came back to campus to watch his daughter graduate, that was awkward enough. I couldn't imagine that. If it could, Notre Dame and LSU in a playoff matchup would be absolutely unbelievable. It'd be a media frenzy, absolutely out of control. Um, but quite frankly, I don't want to see Brian Kelly in Notre Dame Stadium anymore. Bye-bye. Go ahead, Swamp Thing. See ya. Oh, the YouTube video from the other day is um, by Michigan Football Report with James Yoder. It says, breaking five-star QB CG, CJ Carr to commit to, on Thursday, Notre Dame a lock, question mark. Yeah, of course it's is. Yoder. Yeah, of course it's James Yoder. And James Yoder is the same one that was is arguing with CJ Carr's mom back and forth still. That's been going on for three days now, and he won't give it up. And he was doing Twitter about it yesterday. So I know his deal, and he's got a nice little setup, and I like his YouTube stuff. He needs to quit going after this kid's mom and get over it. Now, hopefully, whether... It be CJ or whoever else, we need to get some more receivers for him to throw the ball to. This has got to help. This has got to help. It's like it's hard to pitch. It's hard to pitch that right now because no one has seen enough of Tyler Buckner to know that you can count on him to be good. Like we just don't have that body of work in that film on him. So that is a tough pitch just based on belief. But if you look at this and you look at the talent and the rating and the camp performances and everybody, not even Notre Dame writers, other writers saying he exceeds expectations at these camps. We thought it, he was already good. His footwork's more advanced, zip on the ball, all that kind of stuff. It's beautiful. I absolutely love it. This is shaping up wonderfully. I am thrilled with the beginning of the Freeman era. Thrilled. And you are uh, infinitely right. There is no way Brian Kelly would have even gone after CJ Carr, let alone landed him. No, listen, here's the deal. Brian Kelly was a closer. Everybody else did the hard work. He would try and come in at the end and lock it up. When you are trying to land the top end quarterbacks in these classes, in the NIL era where everybody's offering you different stuff, it's even harder to recruit them. The only chance you have to land one of these guys, a Dante Moore, a CJ Carr, the only chance you have is to build strong, deep, long-lasting relationships with these kids and their families when they're young. Brian Kelly never put in the time it required to do that. And that's why he always struggled with this particular dynamic, getting the elite quarterback right. He wouldn't put in the time. That's never going to be an issue now. Never. That's over. You're never going to have that issue. But it was one for him. You can't jump in it three months before the recruiting cycle ends on one of these quarterbacks. You're three years too late. 
in relationship building. That was our dynamic under Kelly. It was never going to work. Forget it. You would have thought by the way we got beat by Alabama and Clemson in those big games, he would realize we're short on talent. I got to get after it and recruit, but that just never happened with him. It, it just never happened. And the issue with that is there's a trickle down effect of that. And so when the head guy isn't a dog on the trail and doing all that and everybody sees it and hears it, knows it and lives it, there's a trickle down effect of that. On the flip side, when Marcus Freeman is the head coach at Notre Dame with all the obligations that come with that, the alumni meetings, you know, the, the booster meetings, being here, being there, flying here, doing this, doing that, all the stuff that the head guy at Notre Dame has to do, and he is still the number one recruiter involved on everything, that forces all the assistants to go, he's the head coach, look at how hard he's working, I got to do my part. And, the, and it just all comes together. This operation's out, outrageous right now. It's beautiful. Yes. Are you at most home games, uh, John? I wouldn't say most, but I would say the top one and two usually of the year. Like if it's a USC home year, I'm at that for sure. I'm going to be at Clemson for sure this year. Probably Cal the first home game. Um, possibly Stanford, and then I'll see what else happens. But Clemson for sure, Cal for sure, possibly Stanford so far. Because I've been to 20 straight home games, so I'm pretty much at, non-COVID-wise, of course, I'm pretty much at every home game. I was hoping maybe to be able to meet you one day, I mean, at one of these games. Here's what we're going to do. Here's what we'll do. For the Cal game, I believe that's our first home game after Ohio State. Isn't that correct? Or Right. I'm pretty sure uh, that I'd have to look. I'm, you see. I'm pretty sure that's right. The Irish Players Club's gonna have a tailgate event, and I have a bunch of passes for that. So I'll just give you one of my passes. You can come in there, free food, free drinks, bunch of stuff going on. We can meet in there if you want. That would be great. Um yeah, just have to somehow, I mean connect with you beforehand. I got your number right off the screen. I'll put it in my phone. I'll send you a text. We'll connect that way. But I'm dead serious. I got a bunch of passes and I'd be happy to give you and maybe a, another person or two come in. We'll have some free food and drinks, meet some old players and go to the game. That would be awesome. I mean, I'm usually, I park at Whitefield. Do you park on campus? I used to park in the white field, white lot, but then I found some other things that are a little bit more convenient. But I used to park in the white lot just because it's easy and easy out on that toll road, baby. Right out. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I'm one who hangs around for a little while after the games just so I can easily pull right out. So, yep. And so, uh, but I will, I got your number off the caller ID from the call program. I'll send you a text and I'm dead serious. I'll, I'll assign you a couple of those passes and you could stop by. That sounds great. Beautiful. So Pete, let's finish with this. Let me ask you this. How big of a deal is it to you that Notre Dame has a great year next year? Like, if they lose three games, is it going to sour you on the Freeman error? Or are you just going to chalk it up to it's his first year, still flipping the roster, going to take some time? Like, where do you fall on your expectations for this next year? I'm thinking, I mean, we should still probably go at worst nine and three. But, I mean, for what you said, and I mean, I feel too, you can't, it's going to take him some time to un-Brian Kelly this team. I mean, even as great as Lou Holtz was, he was five and six in his first year. Yep. It's, and like you were saying, I mean, with Freeman being a head coach, it's good. There's going to be a learning curve and let's face it. Notre Dame is not just an average job. I mean, there's a lot that goes into being the head coach, so it's going to take him a little bit of time, but with the great, if he can keep up the great recruiting over these next few years, he'll build that talent and the assistants got to do their part too. Yep. That, that makes, so, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I say it all the time on my show and on Twitter, nobody can undo 
12 years of Brian Kelly recruiting in Notre Dame in one year. It's not physically possible to make up for all of the things that kind of started sliding or staying stagnant or that we can never get over the hump on. No one can override all those things in one off season. It is going to take Marcus two to three recruiting cycles, full recruiting cycles to be able to flip this in his vision. Then you're going to get to see the true Marcus Freeman version of what he wants this to be. And oh, by the way, play this along in your mind. If you're building out another couple years of recruiting these elite guys, what else is happening is Marcus is no longer going to be a brand new head coach by that time. He'll have a couple seasons under his belt, make some mistakes, make some decisions that he's going to have to learn from. And it all kind of comes together. So then at the end of that little tunnel, you have a coach who's no longer brand new and wet behind the ears. And you have a flipped roster all under his vision and an electric recruiting effort. That is all you can ask for as a Notre Dame fan. It's what I've been begging for the last two decades, and we've never had it. One thing for sure, and I think you'll agree with me on this. I mean, granted, there's enough things to not like about Kelly. One thing for sure is that, for goodness sakes, Kelly never had had a plan for playing in the rain. That's for sure. That is absolutely for I mean, sure. You want to talk about, what was it? NC State and a hurricane, uh, North, uh, not Northwestern. That was a snow loss was that one. Um, but yeah, that one, well, the big and house. And Michigan. Yeah, 19 at the big house. That game was lost before the, it was even kicked off. That game was over. I mean, basically, I mean, I'm sure you played yard football as a kid in the rain. Yeah, let's throw it around 70 times in the in a hurricane wind. That's beautiful. And blame the center on top of it, too. Yeah, it was, listen, forgive me, but I'm trying to block out a lot of Brian Kelly stuff. And you know what makes me happy? And I'm not trying to be this guy, but sometimes I have to be this guy. I am glad that John Q. Public all just casual, regular Notre Dame fans. Everybody's starting to see behind the scenes into more of the Kelly era. As we get further along here, more and more is coming out from beat writers, from old players, kind of telling you some of the reasons this never could get over the hump now that he's gone. And I'm just glad everybody's seeing it now. And I'm double glad that he's not my problem. He is not my problem. And now I get to watch him in the SEC, and that should be fun every week. How do you think that's going to go down there? Oh, I think he's going to struggle some in the SEC. I mean... Me too. I don't see how he couldn't. Honestly, I think he's going to struggle too. I don't see him winning a national championship. I mean, I think there's as good a chance, at least, of Marcus Freeman winning one before Brian wins one. Hey, I, it's going to be tough down there. And and the only the only thing that counts as success at LSU is winning that conference and then winning playoff games. Like LSU is a place with a high bar and that's the one. If he gets there, I'm going to give him a ton of credit. Like I rip on Brian Kelly a lot and I benefited from making fun of making content mocking him when all this first happened and him dancing on recruits and everything. But I'm telling you, if he finds a way to succeed down there, I'm going to give him credit. I'm going to tip my cap. Absolutely. It blows my mind how some people said the last season was his, one of his, or his best quote unquote, best coaching job at Notre Dame. He did terrible last year. I thought, well, but see, here's why I struggle with that type of discussion. I get what they mean. It was kind of a transitional year with a lot of moving parts and the quarterback dynamic and all that. But the issue is he only had to do that good of a coaching effort last year because of his own shortcomings in recruiting that could have prevented him having to be that great of a coach last year to do what we did. Like, does that make sense? It's all connected. Like if he would have recruited correctly, 
you wouldn't have had to do that good a job coaching last year. You would add more talent and then it wouldn't have had to be this miraculous, great job. Right. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately and realistically, we probably should have lost to Toledo last year. That was a close call. That was a close call. Now I will say this, Brian Kelly did get the program to a point where you could pretty much rely on them beating the teams. We have more talent than every week. And I am going to, I'm going to credit Kelly for that. Like we did get to a point where he was beating teams. We had more talent than most of the time, most, but we plateaued. We plateaued. Everybody knows it. The fan base felt it. We all knew it. And you know what else? Brian Kelly knew it. That's why he moved into a swap as his new address. Yeah. Yeah. Cause he was not a big game coach for us. Yep. I don't think he ever knew how to motivate the guys to get them to play their best when they needed it the most. And at the peak Lou Holtz era, that was one of the things he was best at knowing what buttons to press to get the most out of his guys in the biggest game, biggest moment. That is one of my biggest knocks on Kelly, other than never figuring out an elite quarterback that he could rely on, uh, was I don't think he knew what buttons to push. We just looked like too many big time games were over before they started. You didn't know what you were going to get. Um, all the personality changes, purple face, then the cool guy, then the CEO guy. I never know what was real. It's just complicated with him. And the bottom line is, I'm just glad it isn't my problem anymore, quite frankly. Well, and like you said, I mean, for with Marcus Freeman, if we don't land some of these big guys, we really can't, I mean, be upset because it's not for lack of trying with him because he's going all out. Yep, yep. And that is a huge, huge philosophical change in my mind. Before... Oh, Notre Dame's in the hunt for this big quarterback. And then he goes somewhere else and we finish second. And if you finish second in recruiting, you might as well finish 400th because it doesn't matter. Okay. You either get him or you don't. Um, But that is a big comfort to me is from now on, no matter what happens in these recruitments, I'm never going to lay there and put my head on the pill at the end of the night and go, I wonder if Notre Dame did all they could in this race. I'm never going to have to worry about it. From now on, if Notre Dame doesn't get a recruit, it isn't going to be because of effort or lack of relationship building, lack of reaching out, lack of being connected with the kid and his family. That is over. Notre Dame's going to rise because of it. Book that. I promise that. Yeah, I mean, there's no more, well, we have to shop down a different aisle. I think Marcus Freeman's going down every aisle. Yep. He's going down every aisle and so is everybody else. And it is gorgeous. And a lot of the coaches we thought were going to stick around on this staff for a while that ended up leaving their replacements are recruiting. Fantastic. McCullough recruiting. Fantastic. At Washington recruiting. Fantastic. Like those were guys we, we didn't even weren't even in the picture and here they are and they're doing great. Al Washington is putting in work on the trail work. And I love it. Absolutely. So I think the the future's bright. I am a glass half empty Notre Dame guy by nature, just from my history and my age range hasn't had much to be happy about. I can't do that. I am glass half full, arrow pointing up. Um, I'm I'm hard on Notre Dame, but I'm telling you, if Notre Dame's ever going to find a way to compete in the modern era, they're building it the right way this way. This vibe, this energy, this recruiting, being young, hip, modern, relating to the players, it all lines up to a modern football operation. And I am, I'm, we're blessed to have it. It worked out great. Kelly leaving us like that ended up being the best thing. I'm, I'm thrilled. I am too. I can't wait to see your show after we win a national championship. I, I refuse to even think about that just because I, 
I just can't even go there of what it would be like. I would probably just sit here and cry. I'll be honest with you. I would probably hit record and just cry and just be happy for once. And, and that would be it. I can't even imagine it. How old are you, John? 37. I'm 47, so I'm old enough to remember the 88 team, but unfortunately that feels like forever ago. Yeah. And see, I was too young for that. So I don't, I didn't have any of that. I was really too, you know, too young for 93 right. to understand what was going on then with Florida state. And then we entered the dark ages. So I'm in a rough time frame because I was four when we won and we haven't done anything since I'm ready. We are right. due. We are past due. You mean it? For us to win the national championship, you'd probably even be doing the push-ups with the leprechaun even, wouldn't you? I don't even know what would happen, but it would it, it'd be the best day of my life. So I, I don't know. But Pete, thanks for giving me a call. I wrote down your number. When we get done with this, you might get a text from me so we could stay in touch for when you're on campus for the ball games. That sounds great. Go Irish. John. Beautiful. Go Irish. Thanks for calling. Call again, my friend. Yes, sir. Take care. Have a good evening. You too. Okay. I got something I wanted to bring up here on the screen. Notre Dame will crash and burn with Freeman. That's rough. That's rough. And I would love to know, Dr. Karl Marx, explain why you think Notre Dame will crash and burn with Freeman. Also, Karl Marx, I want to ask this. You can't just say Notre Dame's going to crash and burn with Freeman. I want you to be more specific. Do you mean this year, his first year with no experience, going against Ohio State right away? Or do you mean overall? Because I got a very hard time believing a guy who's been around as much big-time winning football as Marcus Freeman, being in that Ohio State program, getting drafted in the NFL, all the coaching he's done. How You're telling me he's not going to learn how to put it all together and be a head coach? That's what I'm struggling with when you say he's going to crash and burn. That sounds to me like it might be a Michigan fan who doesn't like the way Marcus is recruiting. Like, I would want to know, why are you saying it's going to crash and burn? Like, honestly, if you want to say, Oh, they're going to lose to Ohio State. Yeah, maybe. But that doesn't mean that Marcus Freeman's a bad coach or not going to be a great head coach. If he loses with the old guys roster week one against the top three program at their place at night in prime time, he could lose that game. And it doesn't mean that this isn't going to work. He's not going to be good. It doesn't. It just doesn't. So I would like to know long-term, short-term. I, I just... I think he's too smart to not learn how to be a good head coach. Next year, I'm on the fence. I'm open to the idea. I am wrapping my brain around the idea that Notre Dame might lose a dumb game or two next year. Brian Kelly wouldn't lose. But I think big picture, there's an upside here Brian Kelly would never have. So think about how messed up that is in your mind then I'm saying this next year, if Kelly was the coach, they might win more games, but then there's a big plateau. Marcus has a bigger high end, bigger upside on the deep end. So that's what I think. Next year could be rough. We could lose two dumb games, two games to decent teams. Let Marcus learn it. I want to go back up here. Let's see, Carl. I don't know, Carl. Who's your favorite team, Carl? I got a feeling you're a Michigan guy. You might be EJ or something. Christopher Morgan, thank you. $10 super chat. Let's see what we got. But what if Marcus Freeman does, though? Say we run the table this year with all the excitement. I swear to God. I... <laughs> Listen. Next year's a tough schedule compared to the last two that I thought were a little weaker. And then I thought when you got into the Ohio State Clemson both years, 23, 24, or 22, 23, back to back, yeah, both of them both years, those are tough schedules. 
So if, if they run the table somehow next year, then it's a rocket ship. And then you're going to be able to recruit even more good guys. Like this, what Christopher's bringing up is the high end of next year. What I've been working from is middle ground or maybe what the low end would look like if things go bad, a bunch of injuries, a bunch of problems, whatever, you know, uh, this is the opposite scenario. If they go 11 and one or 12 and 0 next year, this is a rocket ship. You think the recruiting's good now? Just wait till you see what it's like next. It's going to be outrageous if you have that. So Christopher, you're looking at the high end of that. And if it happens, this recruiting is going to be outrageous. Absolutely outrageous. Because what that means is you would be eliminating at that point the biggest negative against Marcus Freeman right now, which is you don't know what kind of head coach he's going to be. You run up 11-1, 12-0 next year, forget it. Rocket ship right to the top. I mean, unbelievable. Christopher, thank you for being here. I appreciate you. Carl Marks again. I'm a Notre Dame fan, but Freeman is not the guy. Sark and Kiffin are better choices. Mark, come on, Carl Marks. You're trying to put a mark in my head. You don't mean that. You don't mean that. There's no, listen, here's the deal with uh, Lane Kiffin too. I love the guy. I think he's hilarious. He has a quirky personality that college football needs, especially in that conference with everybody being all serious all the time. I didn't like Kiffin when he was getting jobs just off his daddy's name and all that. And here's the other thing. I love Lane Kiffin right now, as long as he's not coaching our team. Like, like that is totally weird to say. I love all the quirkiness of Kiffin, and now he's tweeting from his new dog's account. I love all of it. I just don't want him in South Bend. Not a fit. Not a fit at all. Not going to work. So, yeah, I, th I think we're getting some uh, trolling here a little bit. Let's see. Who else we got here? Rodney. I think this is Rodney, California, I believe. Let's see. Rodney, is that yeah, you? Hey, John, what's up? What's going on, buddy? Thanks for yeah, calling. Yeah, it's a, it's, you got it, man. A California number, I've had it for 12 years. I'm in South Bend, actually. But, uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, you show up as yeah, California. Man. Yeah, I lived there from 99 to 2011, and then uh, and then moved to Chicago, and then uh, moved to South Bend after that. Back to South Bend, I should say, because that's where I grew up. But, um, yeah, man, just want to chime in. I'm actually kind of similar to what you're talking about right now, so I might be echoing some things the other guys said, but um, I think there's a possibility that we're going to see much more. Here's what I'm thinking, John. I think uh, this year notwithstanding, because I think it's, there's a lot of, questions going into this season i will say i think it's excellent that we he hired harry he stand to coach the offensive line and the fact that he hired al golden to coach the defense because you got two guys who've been around a long time on each side of the ball to kind of you know be that uh sage influence on the staff and then everybody else is just like great recruiters and you know good coaches as well so i think he he's put himself in a position where he shielded himself enough to where, uh, uh, you know, an 11 and two season or even 12 and one or something like that is possible. But I also wouldn't be surprised if it's one of those eight and four years where we lose three or four games by like, you know, an eyelash, one of those type of things. I think he's going to be more Lou Holtz than Brian Kelly, meaning Brian Kelly was excellent at winning the games he was supposed to win very bad at winning the games he wasn't. Holt was great at winning the games he wasn't supposed to win and occasionally falling flat, especially in games that came after big games. I could see that happen this year. I could see us win like against Clemson and Ohio State, but maybe drop one against uh, BYU or uh, USC at the end of the year, something like that. What do you think, John? I think all those scenarios that you just ran through – are totally on the table, completely reasonable scenarios. And I, I, I think they're all in play. 
I think health has a lot to do with it. Like if we're running with Buckner and I think we are, I'm, I'm worried about Buckner staying in one piece, him running, getting hit. Like that's a big part of the developmental track here. Um, but I'm still, I've said this before and I mean it. If we lose a couple games to teams, we have more talent than next year. Yes. I'm going to do a game review show and be mad about it, but it is not going to sour me on the Marcus Freeman era. It's his first year. He's dealing with talent. He didn't recruit like new coaching staff. There's a lot of moving pieces. If he needs one year to get situated, comfortable with the staff, learn some nuance of being an in-game decision-making head coach, I'm fine with it because I think, the high-end results when we get through that process are worth it. There's a light at the end of the tunnel here. Didn't exist under the old guy because of the way this guy recruits. If I need to be frustrated for one year, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. It didn't exist before. I'll deal with it. No, I couldn't agree more. I, I've already prepared myself for the fact that this year, not saying it's going to be, I, I still have you know decent hopes of, I'm kind of looking at possibly anywhere from two to three losses is where I think the median is. But I also acknowledge that, look, even Kelly, I'll say this much for him, as much as um, we, we rag on him, he gave us five really consistent, really good years. Remember, he had a tough time for a while. They were getting above eight and five. And a lot of it was injuries. He had, I mean, I even will say for him, he had some bad luck those first few years where he just couldn't get the right guys healthy at the right time. And um, I think they would have been better in those first few years under Kelly had it not been for major injuries. So I'm waiting to see. And I know our strength coach is still there, uh, Bayless. So that's awesome, you know. But um, uh, so that's a big. That's obviously it was was a big guy. They uh, an absolute cog in that in that uh, coaching staff that they kept, which I'm very happy for. But I'm still looking at the fact, you know, anything can happen in college football. And then, like you said, with. Uh, with Buckner and Pine, I mean, uh, all it takes is one injury to throw this thing off. You know, I mean, that, that's why. Well, anyway, we've already, you, you've, you've said everything I'm thinking. And with that, John, I'm going to let you go and just kind of let you talk to other guys. And uh, when I'm in Chicago, man, I'll give you a notice and we'll have to have a beer. Beautiful. Let me know, Rodney. Thanks for calling, man. Call again and uh, good thoughts. Call again, my friend. Yeah, lo love the show, John. Keep it up. See you later, buddy. Thanks a lot. Take care. So he brings up something good. Uh, Rodney mentioned, you know, Brian Kelly having a really solid uh, five, five years until he left LSU. And I mean this 100%. Everybody in here knows how hard I was on Brian Kelly with certain things. Not trying your hardest in recruiting is unforgivable. Okay? Unforgivable. You lose a game, bad luck, shit happens. Me knowing you were not recruiting as hard as you need to or could is unacceptable. That is the root cause of my Brian Kelly problems. His personality, whatever. If you're beating the best teams we play, I don't care about your personality as much. Okay? But the problem was I kept hearing and reading and seeing he ain't putting in the effort it takes to get the talent in Notre Dame it's going to take to win a playoff game. And that's not going to change. How many years in a row do I have to live in that existence before we all lose our damn minds? Now, that being said, while Kelly was incapable or unwilling to do what it takes in recruiting to get us over the hump, he did have a really solid last five years. And I mean this. If Marcus Freeman wins a playoff game or, God forbid, wins a championship some year, Brian Kelly's going to deserve a certain amount of credit for that. He is, and that's coming from me. Not exactly a Brian Kelly guy. If Notre Dame achieves more than Brian Kelly could, Brian Kelly's going to deserve some credit, and I'm going to be one of the first ones to give it to him because while he couldn't get it over the top, he has a stable, healthy culture, a lot of winning, not top-level winning, but overall, a lot of winning. He'll deserve a lot of credit for that, and I admit that. Also, Rodney brought up some of these older, other coaches coming in. 
Obviously, you have Harry and you let him do the offensive line thing and you just say, do your thing. Go ahead. Do your thing. Golden is a big deal to me. And the reason Golden's a big deal to me is when Elston was still around, you were like, okay, Freeman's young. He's new. He's going to have a lot to learn being a new head coach at Notre Dame. And it's like, well, at least we have Mike Elston here, who's an old head, been around forever, seen it all, heard it all, done it all, whatever. And you felt like Freeman could lean on that experience. Then Elston leaves. And then you're like, okay, now we're, now it's a little freaky. Like, where's the older guy with all the experience Marcus can lean on then? Um, Harry comes in, but Harry's not exactly that guy, big picture. You give Harry offensive line, let him have these guys pushing semi trucks all over and bullying people. That's not really Harry's gig. Al Golden is a guy who would have got the Notre Dame head coaching job if Brian Kelly turned it down. Everybody knows that, right? If Brian Kelly didn't accept that job, it was going to Al Golden. Al Golden's always liked Notre Dame. He has an affinity and a respect for Notre Dame. The biggest compliment I could give Al Golden is that he wasn't a culture fit at Miami when he was the head coach. That's not a negative. That's a positive. That's a positive. I kept hearing, oh, he wasn't a good culture fit. Look at the culture they had. Who would want to fit it? So that was a compliment that Al Golden wasn't a good fit for Miami. I love that. Great personality trait, not being a fit for Miami. But Al Golden, college coach, NFL coach, head coach, done recruiting, dealt with NFL players, seen it all, done it all, been around the block puts his ego aside, goes to work. He's there to help Marcus. And I love the dynamic. It sounds like this staff is off to off and running. Let's see. I still, does anybody know if Carl Marx is trolling us or being legitimate? I still honestly don't know whether he's trolling or being legitimate. He looked absolutely lost in the Oklahoma State game. Listen, Carl, we've been through this. I've done this on my show a ton of times. I don't know if you're trolling or not, but here's the deal. Look at that Oklahoma State game, and let me ask you, how much of that loss are you putting on Marcus Freeman? How much? Look at all the dynamics. Marcus Freeman just got hired as the head guy. You have to start recruiting instantly. You need to do the national media tour. You need to do the local Notre Dame tour. You need to worry about your staff now and after the bowl game. Who are you going to keep? Who are you going to lose? Who's coming and going? And in the middle of all that, within like a three-week period, they're also supposed to get ready for the bowl game. And then you get in the bowl game. There's a million moving pieces. Um... Here's the thing. Why, why is that Marcus's fault? What happened in the bowl game? Brian Kelly didn't recruit enough to, to put anybody in a position to be able to lock that game up and finish it up. Like I just, too many factors were bizarre for me to look at that and judge Marcus and be all worried that he's never going to figure it out because of that dumb bowl game. I might argue this. I might argue this. It might be better off for Notre Dame in the long run than Marcus Freeman lost that bowl game and didn't win it. If he won it, maybe you would have just thought, oh man, this isn't so hard to do. I got to figure it out already. Won a major bowl game. Notre Dame hasn't won in 20 years in my first game. Maybe the best thing that ever happened was for Marcus to realize he has a lot to learn. I've thought of that long and hard. As mad as we all were after that bowl game, I've thought of it. And maybe that's the best thing that could happen. And it made Marcus realize there's a lot of work to be done around here. A lot of places on this roster that need to be flipped. All of that. All of that. So that was a weird one where this is going to sound like a cop-out. If we would have won that game, we would have all been celebrating it and like whatever. And then when we lost it, I'm like, ah, Brian Kelly problems. His roster falling apart. Back of the defense didn't recruit enough. All those years before Marcus was there, look what happens. You know, whatever, whatever. But I just think 
that was such an odd dynamic that I just, I'm not nailing Marcus on that. Even if something bad happens against Ohio State, I'm not nailing Marcus on that. He's dealing with the roster he didn't create that the other guy we know didn't recruit hard enough created. Let him clean that out. Build it under his image. This Notre Dame roster two to three years from now is going to be unrecognizable. Unrecognizable roster is what it's going to be. Okay. One more call. I think I know who this is. Wisconsin 715. Riker, is that you? Always. Is that you? How are you? Don, say it's not only a good day, it's a nice cube good day. That's what I'm talking about. Anytime Notre Dame gets a commitment, you play that ice cube. Today was a good day. What do you think about this? Did you prefer Dante? Are you happy with Carr? What do you think? I think... Carr is a guy that can help win a championship as so as Dante Moore. Do I'm recruiting them, both of them hard and until they sign. That makes perfect sense. I personally just think it would be asking a lot to land both of them, and I'm not expecting to. And if you do, it's icing on the on top of the cake, but you know you at least have one. Um I'm concerned about NIL behind the scenes being an issue. And I Notre Dame, that's just not Notre Dame's game. And I don't really want it to be our approach. Um, but this will help me sleep at night knowing that we have a five-star guy coming down the track at a position Kelly could never really figure it out. Never. BK was better off like dancing with players, losing them to Nick David and golfing. That's true. Now, let me ask you this, Riker. What do you think about next year? What do you think is the two Irish brothers, the Fiesta Bowl is a transitional game. I agree with that 100%. So many moving parts, so many things beyond your control. Um, Marcus Freeman was technically that coach, but he was doing 50 other things that he's not going to have to do before a game in any other game. It was all bizarre. It was just all bizarre. Okay. So, Riker, what are you thinking next year? Are you going to freak out if we lose a few games? Are you going to are you going to just say it's Marcus's first year, let the guy learn? Where are you at? I think we should see how the season plays out because who holds this first year? He went 5 and 6 and if I remember correctly, when I watch those games, there's a lot of those games he could easily won. So, my expectations for Marcus Freeman is to see what the culture is. He can go 10 and 2, I'll be happy. Nine and three. Well, who was that one team we lose to after like a Clemson, a USC, and Ohio State team? Because look what happened ninety three. Yep, and that that's a good point, a fair point. I am. I we all know if we lose a dumb game, we shouldn't lose next year. I'm going to come in here and start yelling and screaming. That's why you guys are here. We all know that's going to happen but it isn't going to sour me on Marcus Freeman long-term. It is not. He is too smart and been around too much good football to not learn how to be an effective head coach. So if he needs one year to sort this out, blend with the new staff, get the new quarterback going, flip out some of the roster, one more recruiting cycle, I can live with it. The upside when he gets through this learning curve is worth it. It's just worth it. Yeah, it's like also what the next few years is going to be. Because if it goes well, there are going to be coaching changes. Now let's see who is the next replacement. Are you going to replace it with a Harry Heathen with Nelly Heathen? Or are you going to replace a Harry Heathen with a guy like Brian Van Gorder? Yeah, and, but I think we're done with that. And, and I don't think Marcus Freeman is in the business of hi, uh, hiring his buddies like that, this ain't the country club. That's a Brian Kelly thing. That's not going to happen here. If you're going to lose any coaches soon, it's going to be Tommy Reese. Tommy Reese is going to have a lot of NFL offers. It would not shock me if he leaves soon to go be an NFL coordinator. So I know he loves Notre Dame. He could have left last year. He didn't. He came back. I understand all that. And I appreciate his loyalty. Um, but of everybody on this staff, 
That's the one I'm looking at losing. It would not shock me one bit. If Reese goes to the NFL, I couldn't blame him. Um, that's the one I have my my eyes on in the near future. Yeah, you know, also, it's like how it's going to affect recruiting because like, there'll be like some kids are just going to commit to a coach. And you see now there were some years we had consistent coaching when not that much coaching change. Well, if Frank, if Marcus Freeman hits his ceiling, there's going to be a lot of coaching changes. And how, how much is that going to affect recruiting? Yep, that's a, that in a few years. Yep, that's a good point too. Um, right now, I love the blend of this staff with younger guys, older guys. I think that's a very, very healthy blend. Um, and I'm excited. And the other thing is they all work. They're not afraid to recruit all of those guys. Because the head guy recruits his ass off, it, there's a trickle down. And nobody else can slack and get away with it like you could when the swamp man was in charge. So they all work their asses off. That's not going to change. It's just going to intensify. They're going to build more relationships at these high schools. People need to realize there are phone calls being made and received and doors being opened that never existed under Brian Kelly. Literally, people are calling and opening doors that didn't exist under Kelly because he didn't put in the time to build those kind of relationships in these kind of these kind of areas or these states or wherever it is. I'm telling you, this is the only way Notre Dame wins in the modern era is building it this way, recruiting it with this energy, having this vibe, young, hip, modern, cool, energetic, all of that. I absolutely love it. I'm here for all of it, Riker. Playing here, I'm ready to die on a hill for him. Me What's too. Me too. I love this man. I, I just, so far, so good. Maybe it's a honeymoon phase, and, it, and if we go eight and four next year, half the fan base will jump off the bandwagon. I'm not going to, even if next year gets rough. Why? He's dealing with a roster he didn't create. So I'm going to give him the chance to flip that roster out where he thinks he needs to before I'm going to freak out about it, okay? So that's what I'm going to do. But recruiting is the lifeblood of any college football program. And for once, I lay to bed every night. And when I close my eyes, I at least know that in that respect, we're in great hands. And I couldn't say that before because I just knew it wasn't true. Now I know it's true. This is an elite recruiting effort. Yeah. Definitely, definitely elite recruiting effort. Took it down for the head coach. The left head coach they didn't bother to recruit. And there was like three or four guys on the staff he was unwilling to get rid of. Stayed there. Oh, let me see here. You have Andre Denson, Todd Light, Brian Gorder. Mike Dan Brock actually knew what he was doing. Jeff Quinn, so I continue? Yep. And, and, you know, that is a big knock on Brian Kelly um, is the, the, he tended to not only hire his country club buddies sometimes, but when it was obvious it wasn't working, he held on to him too long too. And that is a, that's a cardinal sin in coaching um, is waiting too long to make some of those changes. Um, so Riker, thanks for calling buddy. We're going to get, we're going to move it along here. Get going. You have a good one. Yeah, yeah, man. Take care. I wanted to go back to something Thomas Noble said, an old coworker of mine from the old days in Chicago. What's the personality of the team going to be like in the next two years? My opinion is we have to lead with defense. Here's what's interesting about that. First off, it's good to see you. I miss you, buddy. Uh, text me. We'll meet up. But here's my thought. Initially, like next year and probably into the beginning of the following year. I think the strength of this team is going to be what the historical strength of the team's been the last handful of years that we've been winning 10 or more games every year. This defense is the rock that has made all of that possible that you could rely on to keep us in these games or hang around or beat the teams we should beat. The defense has been the strength of the program 
through the run of double-digit plus wins since 2017 till now, and I expect it to continue into next year. However, where I think this gets exciting is when the offense starts to catch up a little bit and they start making plays, and then we end up in a scenario where I could start to trust the offense to do some good things to win us some games. We're just not used to that. Our offenses are never electric enough for us to just trust. They're going to turn it on, make some plays, put up a bunch of points to be exciting. I'm just not used to that. I can't rely on that. So I think early on, you're going to have to rely on what we've been relying on. But then I think you're going to see that offense start to catch up. You're going to start seeing that offense play with a confidence that we are not used to seeing with an efficiency we're not used to seeing, with a penchant for making game-changing plays in a heartbeat that we're not used to seeing. That stuff can't come overnight. It takes the right guys and the right coaching and the right blend of both of those things. So early on in the Freeman tenure, defense is going to be what they've been relied upon to be the backbone then I think you're going to see the offense catch up. That is where it gets exciting because then you end up in a position where you know the defense is going to be able to do what they need to do, and then I know the offense can do what they do. That's where you want to be. With us, it seems like it's it's there's always one piece missing somewhere, right? So great question, Tom. Good to see you again, man. I miss you. Those were the old days. We're getting old, Thomas. Getting old. Michael Campbell, another Notre Dame commitment tomorrow, too. Who's that going to be? Did I miss this? Did this come out while I was doing this show and haven't been on Twitter or what? What do we got? All right. We're going to see one more caller here. 615. I think I know who this is, too. 615. Is this Matthew? John, what is happening, brother? What's going on, man? Thanks for the call. What do you think of all this excitement? What do you make of all this news? Uh, it's, it's a dream, man. I'm just hoping we don't wake up. But thinking about all this, and I also want to um, talk about the the um, bowl game, too. I had the same feeling you did initially, and I was so pissed. So pissed what happened. But then thinking about it, this is probably the best thing because that confidence level and – all that, you know, let's see what we got to work with now, you know, what we have to do to win these kind of games. So I wanted to throw that in because a couple calls before we talk about it, but man, just think about this Uh, last season, watching that Cincinnati game and just cussing and just so mad. And that was the best thing that could have happened to us. Look, look where we're at now. Yep. It's unbelievable. It's funny how that all works out. Right. Like, like if we win that game, Brian Kelly's still here. We probably lose in the playoff anyways. And Brian Kelly's here, rinse, repeat. And we do it all over again. And in a, in a way, him ditching yep. us in the middle of the night for the LSU did us a favor. I'm, I'm happy about it. I'm actually, I like Brian Kelly more now than I ever did when he was coaching here. I'm a big, I love it now because he allowed all this to come together and I just feel like there's John. It's John, a higher John, window. No, you're jealous. You, jealous. You're jealous, John. Jealous of what? Notre Dame, remember? Oh, yeah. Yeah, remember, yeah. You're jealous that Kelly left to go to, to yeah. LSU. Yep, they stole no, my man. Tomorrow. That's right. Yep. Tomorrow, the commitment. Um, I, IPC, Nick was saying that we're going to have a commitment on IPC tomorrow on Twitter Spaces. Beautiful. Keep it coming. Keep it coming. Do we know, is it 23 Who, class or 24 class? I don't know. I haven't been on the Discord server in the last hour or so to see, but I think it's a 23. Interesting. I'll get on when we're done here. But but I just, the whole thing with the LSU folks saying that I'm jealous and I'm mad and it's like they stole my they stole my main man and now I'm, they just won't listen. I just kept telling them, didn't like the guy ready for everybody to part ways amicably for a while. They will not listen. They are convinced I'm jealous and I'm sad and I'm upset and they stole my boyfriend. I don't know what to do. That's what they think. It's not true. 
I know. Um, and my wife can attest to it that I've been wanting Kelly, you know, I, I would not be dissatisfied if he, if he had left within the last couple of years because I knew he wasn't going to quite get us over the hump. It's a plateau. Still, that it's, a, it's a plateau that everybody and, could feel. The fans felt it. He felt it. He plateaued at Notre Dame. I, That's it. Yeah, and I will I will never forgive him for keeping Brian Van Border because that is – Oh, what what Jalen Smith could have been. I mean, he was still unbelievable, but in a competent with a competent defensive coordinator, think about what he could have been. Yep. And it's just, I don't know, man. It, it's again, it's very tough because Brian Kelly did a lot of really good things at and for Notre Dame. Like he did. He just couldn't get it over the top. And that's fine. So keep it moving. And then we get the next guy in here who has a slightly different skill set that fills up the slack of the part Kelly wasn't getting done at Notre Dame. So it's a great fit. You have the culture Kelly instilled, some of the big picture stuff, getting some sort of training table and, and Bayless and all like infrastructure things behind the scenes. I know Kelly's going to say not enough of that got done fast enough for him, but he really did take over the program when they were in a very, very low spot, did a lot of great things. It was just time for everybody to move on. And right now everybody's happy. I'm happy. The fan base is happy. Kelly's rich and he's where he wants to be. He's happy. So right now, good vibes in the summer all around, right? Yep. Yeah, I'm with you on that too, Kelly. He he got he got our program stable because wow, we were in shambles. Yeah, he did. But it's just when it came time that what he was doing needed to adjust or it wasn't going to go any further, he was unwilling or unable to do it, and that's fine. But he does deserve a lot of credit, yep. and if they win it, win a championship or win, uh, he's going to deserve some credit for that. And uh, I mean, I'm mature enough to admit that and give him that. Um, he just couldn't get it over the hump. So if we're looking at next year, what do you think is a realistic record? What, what would you guess? What are you expecting to see next year? Oh man, I am all over the place. Me too. It's hard. um, I could see it going a lot of different ways. Good, bad, and in the middle, right? We just, we just don't know about, it's all Buckner. We, We don't know enough about him. If I, if I knew more about, how we could throw, then I would, I think I'd have a better answer. Cause I think defense is going to be stout. It's is Buckler, Buckler going to be able to throw the ball. Cause if not, they're going to stack the box on us. And mm, yeah, I just don't know. Yeah. It's uh, next year. I'm, I'm, I'm anywhere from 11 and one. Yeah. 11 and one to eight and four. I, I just don't know. I, yep. I, I agree with say. that. I and if no I was, idea. If I was the odds makers, if I was Las Vegas and you were like, John, you're the guy making the decision. What's the over under on Notre Dame's win total this year? I would put it at nine and a half, like right at nine and a half is where I'd put it. And that's where a lot of people have it right on the borderline of 10 and two or better, or, you know, nine wins. That means you're losing three games. Nobody's going to want to drop back under 10 wins, but I'm still saying this. If I have to drop back under 10 wins one year to get this all going to where I think the talent we're accumulating is going to get it, I'll make that deal 100 times out of 100 with a smile on my face. Absolutely. That's that's how I feel. Next year has no relevance on my feeling for Freeman and moving forward. And I'm on the same. I mean, we think alike. It's now in two years, if he still hasn't done anything and we're looking bad then, then might need to dig a little bit deeper, but I understand it's going to take a little bit of time to throw this into the powerhouse. We think it's going to be, yeah, and we hope it's going to be. I just think the number one thing that needed to change from Brian Kelly to whoever the next guy was, not even Freeman, the number one thing that needed to be addressed is being addressed, and it is changing the way Notre Dame operates in recruiting. That is the only way we're going to be able to compete and it's happening. And that is my number one thing on the list and it's checked off. Now it has to continue. Can't be a one and done where you're doing great for 23 and then you level off or taper off or you have a few, a couple bad games and then it goes back down. 
you can't have that. You need to maintain this aggressiveness in recruiting. But how can he, he's so smart. He's going to figure out how to be a head coach. Give him one year, work out the kinks. He'll figure it out. He's been around too much winning good football to not figure it out, I think. And he's too, he's too humble of a person not to seek, you know, advice from Al Golden or heck, even call Jim Tressel, you know, help me with this situation, you know, when something, I mean, he, he's just a humble, he, he is the complete opposite of, of Kelly as far as, you know, Kelly, it was all about him and Freeman, it's, he's so humble and it is such a refreshing, it's just so refreshing listening to him talk and speak. Yeah, it, it really is. And, and just the, I don't know if it's exaggerated because their personalities are so opposite between Kelly and Freeman, but just the fact that you want to just believe everything he says and it comes off genuine, just hits you different. And that's very Notre dame and it just all works. Like, I just, I just like it. I believe what he says. I feel like it's real. It's genuine. He's not playing games. There's not as much as that ego. It all just works. I love it, and I'm here for it. I just it, the season can't get here quick enough. It's such a long off season with waiting to see what's going to happen. Oh, yep, I I, agree. I I can't. I cannot wait. I agree with you. So, Matthew, we're getting ready to wrap up the show here. But thank you for calling. Call again next time. All right, brother. We'll talk to you soon. Let's go Irish. Go Irish. Have a good evening. Here we are. Carl Marks again saying Brian Kelly's a superior coach to Marcus Freeman at this minute. Sure. That's not even offensive. If you're trolling, he has no body of work. So obviously right now, yes, Brian Kelly's a superior coach to Freeman. However, with the, on the same token, Marcus Freeman's 100% a better recruiter than Brian Kelly. So, right? Like one of these or one of these? Yes, Marcus Freeman has no experience. He was brought in because of the personality and the recruiting with the assumption that he's going to learn and pick up how to be a head coach quickly while accumulating all the talent that Brian Kelly was too lazy to recruit. So, Yes, Brian Kelly's a superior head coach to Freeman now because he has no body of work to compare with. With no body of work, I already know Freeman's 100% a better recruiter than Marcus Kelly. Could, Marcus Kelly, I just combined them both. Brian Kelly could ever be just based on effort, communication, style, all of that. That's all. Just a big difference. Just a big difference. This Marcus Freeman vibe works. I'm telling you guys. It's a very unique job to win a championship at Notre Dame in the modern era. Very unique. It has to be a great combination of a lot of things all at the same time because of the extra challenges at Notre Dame. And we all know what those are. Marcus Freeman's it. Marcus Freeman's it. As far as the youth, the energy, the recruiting, the buzz, all of it. I love it. The, just... I haven't felt this good about Notre Dame ever in my life. And that's very awkward. It's, it's very awkward. So I don't know that that's where I'm at with this. So, all right, guys, we have gone two hours and 15 minutes. I really appreciate everybody being here. This was a great, great night for Notre Dame. Great, great night for Marcus Freeman. I'm happy for the Carr family. I'm glad that he can go ahead and build his own legacy at Notre Dame, do it his way with Marcus Freeman. I think that is a beautiful arrangement that's going to work. And the fact that it's car is just an extra cherry on top. I love it. So thank you everybody for being here. I really appreciate the support. Make sure you hit subscribe. If you're in here and you haven't yet, give the video a thumbs up, hit subscribe. We will talk to everybody. I'll probably put something out tomorrow even, if not Monday for sure. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Even Karl Marx, the troll. Thanks for being here, doctor. Have a good night, everybody.